Hi, I'm Mackenzie Fagan, filling in for Ashley Ford, and this is 112BK. Coming up on the show, two artists with Brooklyn ties, one a writer, actor, and beatbox champ with a new autobiographical multimedia performance. I wanted them to see the beauty and the aesthetic of this, of these, mo these bodies moving through space in all of their beauty and all of their pain. And so what I think you get with the show uh, is something that's a little bit different than what you may be accustomed to. And then a Brooklyn filmmaker originally from Ghana, the setting of his first feature film. The Barrel of Koja was an opportunity for me to set the film in Africa, but tell a beautiful story, tell a magical story, away from the norm of war and, and things that have been propagated through Hollywood cinema. Hi, thanks for joining us. In a few moments, we'll talk to a Ghanaian musician and filmmaker now living in Brooklyn and celebrating this Friday night's premiere of his first feature film, The Burial of Kojo at Urban World Film Festival. But first, we're going to talk about the new autobiographical off-Broadway play, The Unwritten Law, featuring Chesney Snow. If the name is familiar, that's probably because of this. No! That's right, he's one of New York City's top beatboxers and co-founder of the World Beatbox Association. And while his new play does incorporate some beatboxing, it is, as I said, autobiographical, it also hits some weightier notes like race, incarceration, Jim Crow laws, and absent or abusive fathers. Broadway World called it 65 minutes of the most powerful theater she's ever witnessed. To tell us more about the performance and the inspiration behind it, we welcome Mr. Snow to our studio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you about the title of the show, The Unwritten Law. Where does that come from? Uh, the title, The Unwritten Law, uh, actually came from my co-creator. Uh, she had con she had reached out to me in a lot of our work, our pre-work, uh, and she suggested this title uh, for the, uh, the show uh, because it really did speak to uh, a lot of the themes in the show. Um, one of the stories, for example, uh, that we investigate is the story of my great uncle. Uh, so my great uncle uh, was, was lynched, and on the photograph of, uh, of his lynching, uh, which, was, uh, which was auctioned uh, as a postcard in 2010, um, was um, on the back of that card was written the unwritten law. And my co-creator really explained to me what that means. You know, she has, uh, uh, Rebecca Ahrens, uh, the director choreographer, uh, also has a, a, an extensive background in African American studies uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And, um, and it was really about uh, these, these laws. The, you know, some of these laws we think of as like the Jim Crow laws, you know, laws that were actually on the books. Um, there are also laws uh, that were kind of the customs of society. Um, and so those unwritten laws uh, really had an impact on, on, li on black life. So the piece touches on Jim Crow laws as well as these other unwritten laws, um, as well as some of your own autobiographical experiences. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, one of the things that it talks about is your journey from homelessness to Harvard. Is that right? Right, right. So, you know, my uh, a lot of the experiences that I go into uh, in the show, uh, you know, are just these, um, these really American stories. Uh, and one of the things that we, you know, that we found ourselves in uh, when we were younger uh, was... Um, was homelessness, was living at homeless shelter, uh, uh, a shelter for battered women, uh, because my mother was going through some very difficult uh, 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 relationships, and as a single mom who did not necessarily have uh, equity passed down to her, um, you know, financially, uh, it's very hard. So there are a lot of uh, single mothers, single fathers out there uh, who are dealing with the reality of like lo you know not having a place to to live uh we found ourselves in that position 
um, in my adult life, uh, I also found myself, you know, living in a homeless shelter in Arizona. Um, funny, I had just did a play called All's Well That Ends Well, and it was kind of ironic, but I learned a lot in that uh, experience of being in these uh, spaces, in these uh, shelters. Um, they, when I was in Arizona, uh, it really drove me, and I said to myself at that time that if I was going to be homeless, then I would rather do that in Oklahoma City, I mean uh, New York City going after my dreams and so um i i did just that i, I got on uh, i had saved up the money i had a little bit of money from the summer stock play that i did uh, all's well that ends well and i got on a greyhound bus and i went to new york i'd never been to new york but i knew some people here and uh and yeah i just um, i started by selling art on the street you know uh and then beatboxing and spitting poetry on the streets of New York. And, you know, eventually I just kind of worked my way up. Uh, Harvard came from, uh, I got to, I was, a, I was invited to Harvard through a film that I worked on uh, with my co-producers and my director. Um, and I've been an artist in residence there three times. And so uh, we screened our film American Beatboxer there and then I went back to teach uh, hip hop and uh, beatboxing and various uh, even theater uh, discussions on the theater. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just really a wide journey, you know, when you're going from homeless uh, spaces uh, to being at an Ivy League university and, and teaching young students. It's, it's a remarkable journey. It seems like such a personal piece that you've put together mm -hmm. and not only a personal piece, but one that deals with some incredibly challenging themes and to right. me that seems like an act of tremendous courage and vulnerability to mm. talk about um, incidents in your own life and then the mm. life of your family uh, right. like homelessness like lynching right. why did you decide to put yourself out there like that and why did you feel like now was an important time to do that okay so I the 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 spark kind of came from uh, Trayvon Martin and um, and then it kind of hit me harder with, with Michael Brown of seeing uh, these young men who were my son's age, because I was a young f uh, teen father, um, and just really understanding uh, the kind of terror that we, that we live under, thinking that this, this can happen to your father, this can happen to your son, this can happen to you. Um, and one of the things that I felt when I was uh, like the rest of the nation going through that experience was that it seems like w the story that we get of who these people were uh, is often skewed through the media after uh, their murders. Um, and we just know their names. Uh, we don't necessarily know who they are, where they came from, what, what kinds of triumphs and trials that they've had in their life. And so when, um, when I, saw this, uh, uh, this movement beginning to resurge around, uh, around the issues of these particular inequities. Um, I, s I wanted to uh, use my art in order to uh, communicate something uh, and, and to be a kind of a, a, a catalyst for, uh, you know, for change and, and wanting to fit into the fabric of what was happening now. And I thought that my s that if I just told my story, uh, then it, it would serve as a, a bit of a, a metaphor. And I think people will get that in the play, the way it's designed. Do you feel like theater and maybe art more generally has the power to affect social change? And what do you hope that audiences take away from this? Uh, I, I think that uh, it does. Um, I think you can't have social change without the arts, you know. Um, because the the arts are um, the arts are the, the kind of one of those things within our uh, society that pushes the ability for people to think for themselves, right? Creativity. That's why you know losing those out of our educational institutions can really uh, 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 make us very susceptible to uh, totalitarianism. Um, because then people kind of can just have group think, 
you know. Uh, it's very easy for a demagogue to kind of come along and, uh, and fool people uh, when they don't have some of these, uh, ba these other tools that, that creativity gives you, uh, most specifically, I think, empathy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think that, it, you know, in the tradition of Harry Belafonte or Nina Simone or Paul Robeson or all of these great artists uh, that came before us or before me, you know, Bob Dylan, all of these people that, that use their arts as a, as a way to communicate uh, um, a, the the way in which we uh, we can come together and and use our power uh, um, to kind of fight back against these uh, these systems of oppression, I think is uh, is critical. And I and I hope that my art does that, um, and I want to be a part of that movement. And the show itself is very interdisciplinary, right? It has uh, music, it has beatboxing, mm -hmm. but also yes. dance and right. projections, right? Well Why did you choose to take this approach? Right, because uh, uh, I was always captivated by the term choreo poem uh, for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow is enough in Tozaki Shange. Um, it's that uh, form always spoke to me, that idea of, of using verse and movement uh, I love dance. I love to, and I wanted to watch these these bodies in space. And so, when I met the perfect collaborator, uh, Rebecca Ahrens, uh, she not only had this rich history in Afro AM studies, but sh you know she went to the Ailey School. You know she's she's a, a, a professional contemporary dancer, and sh and she really worked to uh, choreograph movement to the words as opposed to movement just to the music, and so. I wanted for people, I wanted to break the form of what we traditionally see as solo shows. A lot of the times you see a solo show, and, and I love them, and you see the brilliance of someone becoming different characters right in front of your, your face, right? Um, but I wanted it to be a little bit less about me and watching me, since the story is already about me and my family. Mm -hmm. But I wanted them to see the beauty and the aesthetic of, this, of these, mo these bodies moving through space in all of their beauty and all of their pain and so what I think you get with the show uh, is something that's a little bit different than what you may be accustomed to uh, when you're going to see these stories told uh, in this form. And tell us where we can see the show. You can see the show at Dixon Place uh, which is uh, downtown on Christie Street. I believe it's 161A uh, Christie Street. It's a beautiful black box theater. Uh, we've got three performances left, uh, Friday and Saturday this week, and then Saturday the 29th Great. of the last week. And the show is The Unwritten Law, yeah. so go see it. Yes. Um, do we have time to ask you to beatbox? Could you just uh, do Sure. I, I, I kick a little beat for you. That All would be right. great. Thank you so much, Chesney Snow. Thank you. In one of his more popular songs, Blitz the Ambassador sings Make You Know Forget Where You From. Though now living in Brooklyn, he's originally from Ghana, and the country provides inspiration for much of his work, including his new narrative feature, The Burial of Kojo. Set amidst the backdrop of the country's illegal, small-scale gold mining industry, it's a story about two brothers and their complicated tale of revenge. But instead of me telling you any more, who better to talk about the film than Blitz Bazawule, who, as a rapper, goes by Blitz the Ambassador. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you for having me. And we also have a special guest with us, a young Ghanaian member of the cast who's traveled here for this weekend's premiere at Urban World Film Festival. Cynthia Dankwa, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for the film. Um, I read that it was uh, inspired by an article you read about illegal gold mining in Ghana, which is, is not something that we know very much about here in the States. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that issue and about why you were inspired to make a film. Well, of course. Um, the idea that you know young people were risking their lives, you know, going 30 feet deep into the ground um, for, for gold that they usually sold at very cheap prices was something that attracted me, first of all. I'm asking myself why, right? And then kind of the more I dug into that, you know, I found the tragedy that kind of su 
surrounds this uh, trade, but also kind of like the political and social implications of it all. So, you know, making a film, I mean, I feel like that you, filmmakers are kind of the mirror to society and, and artists in general, but definitely film is something that could really shine this kind of light that I, I wanted. So I thought it was an interesting um, story, and the more I dug, the more I found out, you know, it could be intriguing. So tell us a little bit about what the film is about. Well, the film is about two brothers, um, um, and it's told from the perspective of um, our lead character, AC, who is played by Cynthia Dankwa, um, and it's much later in her life, and she's recounting what's happened. But most of it is through a magical realist lens. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of adventure that isn't quite, that floats between the real and, and, and the magical. Um, but what happens is that uh, her father goes missing, her father Kojo, and she has to embark on this journey to find him. And um, her brother, his brother is kind of who we suspect is responsible. So that's what the story is about. And Cynthia, had you ever done any acting before? No. This is your first film? Yes. Tell me a little bit about the character you played and what you liked most about her. I played the role of AC, and what I liked about my role was when I was saving my father. Do you think the character of AC is like yourself? Do you identify with her? Not really. Um, <laughs> Blitz, I want to come back to some of, of these um, magical, yeah. realist vibes that you were talking about. Yep. So you chose to tell this story in a bit of an unconventional way. Um, there's also an entire telenovela Absolutely. that you shot and is yeah. contained within the film. Yeah. Talk to me about why you took a bit of an unconventional approach to this story. Yes, well, first um, I think about how my first introduction to storytelling, you know, was through my grandmother and her stories. It's back when, you know, we would sit outside with her and, and listen to her tell her stories. And one thing I noticed about them was they were never linear. They were always secular, non-linear, very magical. Characters came out of nowhere. They disappeared. Um, and I've always been intrigued by that kind of storytelling. I felt that as an African, this is a real interesting perspective and something that makes us. So it was a real opportunity for me asking myself, well, if my grandmother had a camera, how will she tell these stories? And so that's kind of how I approached The Barrel of Kojo in terms of unconvention. So time is something that we play with a lot in the film. And the telenovela was, was kind of adding that terrestrial element. So there's like the time travel that's backwards. There's the magical space that's kind of its own augmented world. And then there's the terrestrial world. But it also kind of had a parallel story. And I wanted to preempt some of what will happen to characters in the real world that we were in um, and kind of relate that to our characters in the telenovela. So, you know, they're very similar. They're two brothers who have an issue in the telenovela. And, but it also kind of showed how art can imitate life sometimes. And it also gave us uh, an idea of where a lot of Ghanaians get their ideas of love, hate, uh, relationships, family. Um, we've been watching telenovelas since the 90s, and the biggest one was Acapulco Bay. And so, you know, I, I wanted to kind of bring that back and uh, kind of mirror that with our characters. And you shot the film entirely in Ghana, is yes. that right? Yes. Why was that important to you, and was that a challenge? It's a huge challenge, uh, but I'll speak about the importance first. Um, I felt that cinema um, generally um, hasn't been too fair to Africa. Um, if you look at the amount of um, information um, that's been in cinema, um, and you look at the, the variants of narrative, you find that they revolve around very, very few topics that are almost always unflattering. And so um, The Barrel of Koja was an opportunity for me to set the film in Africa, but tell a beautiful story, tell a magical story, away from the norm of war and, and things that have been propagated through Hollywood cinema, um, and also kind of give, give intimate portraits, because that's what we, we haven't seen in African cinema. It's almost always set in dystopia, so you don't get to feel characters and how they react in everyday life. So this was a critical thing. Um, in terms of the difficulty, um, anything important is difficult. So I kind of went in knowing that this was going to be, I was going to get pushback, not just from the, 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 the you know, the, 
the community um, that I was trying to raise the money from, you know, but it was also like, I knew that the community that I was gonna be filming in as well, I'd have to educate and explain to them the importance of um, taking our image serious. So this was, this was quite a, a dual battle, and I think we won. And many of your actors had never been in front of the camera before. Yes. How did you find people like Cynthia? Well, Cynthia's story is amazing. Um, I made a short film a few years ago, and um, um, with, with my partner at the time, Terrence Nance, we, we, um, we made a beautiful film called Native Son. And um, he, uh, we, we, we cast her older brother for that role. And this was back in 2010. And I remember her, she was two years old at the time, crawling on the floor while we were making that film. And years later, I go back to Ghana to make a film and she pops in, his, her brother pops in to say hello, and he's with her. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you'll be perfect. So that's how I found Cynthia. She hadn't acted before. Um, the rest of the cast kind of came together in a kind of hodgepodge way as well. But we spent a lot of time uh, preparing for the, these roles. So over a year was spent in rehearsal. And it wasn't even about um, learning lines. It was about embodying characters. And, uh, and that's kind of what um, I was super glad to have. Actors that had the raw talent, but were also willing to experiment. Cynthia, when Blitz said that he wanted to put you in his movie, what were your thoughts? My thoughts were that the film might be a great success and that it would be very interesting and I'll be able to cooperate with others. Was it fun for you to make the film? Yeah. What was the most fun part of it? Oh, me dancing while selling fish. <laughs> <laughs> you dancing while selling fish? Mm -hmm. I can't wait. I can't wait to see the film based on that description alone. Alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this is a film about Africans set in Africa. Yeah. What do you hope that Brooklyn audiences take away from it? Well, um, the fact that um, life is similar everywhere, you know, and and um, people are going through the same set of emotions no matter where they are. Um, unfortunately, back to my point, we haven't seen enough diversity in storytelling. So, you know, there just hasn't been the level of empathy when it revolves around the continent of Africa because I feel like the stories of Africa have just not been told. So if you think about how you feel about, say, France, it's because I've seen Amelie a million times. So my, the way I feel about that is through a filmmaker like Jean-Pierre Jeunet's uh, uh, viewpoint, and that make that has humanized Paris. It's humanized its people, and so I have a I have a an empathy for them. And if anything happens in Paris, I'm I'm, I'm I feel it immediately because of my cinematic experience. Um, that can't be said for Africa because you can't name that many films that you've seen that has given you the opportunity to connect with the continent, its characters. And um, I really feel like Brooklyn can, will connect on that human level. And I think it will build a kind of empathy that the cinematic arts has, allows us to. So I'm excited to see this film. Unfortunately, I cannot go to the premiere because it's sold out. So congratulations. Wow. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's a good, so good problem to have. Exactly. <laughs> so for people like me who can't wait to see the film, The Burial of Kojo, what are our opportunities to see it? So we are in the process of negotiating a distribution deal for the film, which is amazing, coming from, first, the fact that it's, a, it's an independent film. It's, it's my first. Um, it's super exciting for me. I can't disclose, but it's, it's going to be in theaters um, in 2019, and we are super excited about it. So if you miss it this time, just know that it's coming. That's great, and people can check it out on a Facebook page or Instagram. Absolutely, we are we are everywhere, the ha and uh, the handle is at the Burial of Kojo, and it's uh, we're on, we're, we're, we update a lot. Great, well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and Cynthia, you. thank you for joining us as well. You're welcome. <laughs> And now some news in collaboration with Brooklyner. Wednesday night, a 61-year-old Brooklyn resident and a grandmother to two generations of U.S. citizens was deported back to Mexico in the dead of night. After two months of detention in an ICE facility, Gloria Hernandez Suarez was transported out of the country without a word to her family. 
After residing in the United States without documentation since 1985, Mrs. Hernandez had her first brush with ICE in 2001 when she re-entered the U.S. with false identification. Immigration activists say part of the blame goes to her lawyer, who, despite knowing he could not secure her legal entry to the country, entered her name into the federal system. This eventually led to Mrs. Hernandez's arrest in her home in July. The New Sanctuary Coalition released a statement saying that they, quote, decry laws that allow people to be deported after living in the country for decades, and they denounce lawyers who expose our friends to danger of deportation in order to financially benefit themselves. The Museum of the City of New York opened an exhibit with a look back at the history of infectious diseases. September 15th marked 100 years since the Spanish flu epidemic swept across the world. And although it led to the death of over 100 million people, including some 33,000 New Yorkers, it still remains one of the most overlooked medical events in history. And you'll be surprised to know that the Spanish flu isn't related to Spain at all, really. Historians traced the name back to censors during the First World War, who, in order to keep Allied morale high, quashed most of the reports of flu fatalities in Germany, the UK, France, and the US. They were, however, free to report about the casualties in Spain, creating the false impression that the country had been hit especially hard by the disease. The Museum of the City of New York's exhibit, Germ City, Microbes, and the Metropolis, will be on display now through April 2019. For more on these and other stories, check out Brooklyner at BKLYNER.com. And then there's this. 71 years ago today, New York City lost one of its most beloved mayors, Fiorello LaGuardia, who occupied City Hall for three terms until 1945. Perhaps less widely known is that LaGuardia also served in the U.S. Congress, interrupted by a stint as a pilot in World War I. While in Congress, he supported women's suffrage and child labor laws and opposed prohibition. My kind of guy. His name now graces one of the city's most popular high schools and least popular airports, plus the Kings County Republican Club here in Brooklyn. But perhaps he's best remembered for the time during a newspaper strike when he took to the airwaves to read the comics to entertainment-starved kids. So, as we pour one out for the little flower, we bring you this bit of archive. Here's Dick Tracy. Here, the first picture is the laundry wagon. It's a yellow laundry wagon. And wet wash, that's the driver, you know. He's uh, very calmly sitting down with his back toward the back of the wagon, eating his lunch. Uh, our little friend, Beating Hot, what is her name? I'll get it in a minute. Uh, she's inside with the money. And she says, when are you going to let me out of here? He says, wet boy says, easy, sister, easy. And then the next picture, uh, wet boy says, I'll let you out when you've decided to give me a better cut of that dough. That's the show for today. Please tune in next week when we're visited by a South African delegation from the Nelson Mandela Foundation, here to retrace the Freedom Fighters' time in Brooklyn back in the 1990s.